praise his name. I'm glad to be in his house today. Today, as Brother Newbern already said, we're going to start a new series today, as in teaching today. Um, if you will turn with me to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, I'm going to read a couple verses and then we will get started. We're talking about creation. We, some of us learned this about creation and, and or in the beginning. We learned about the creation. We learned it in Sunday school. But today we're having, going to have a refresher course on, on the beginning. But we're going we're gonna to talk about the purpose of creation. Genesis chapter 7, I mean Ge- Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. The Bible says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Verse 8 says, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. If you will, join me in prayer right now. Lord, I ask you right now, Lord Jesus, to touch me today. Lord, I ask you right now, Lord Jesus, to minister through me today, Lord Jesus, to this congregation. Lord, I ask you right now, Lord Jesus, to touch everyone that's under the sound of my voice today. Lord, I ask you, Lord Jesus, to touch them, Lord, and anoint them, Lord Jesus. Lord, familiar words, but Lord Jesus, I ask you to give it a fresh anointing today. Lord, I ask you to touch us and anoint us today, Lord Jesus, in this service. Lord Jesus, in your name, Jesus' name, you may be seated. God desires to have a relation with humanity, a relationship with humanity. And today, that's where I'm going to talk today is about that relationship and building that relationship. We look through time and we look through and we look at the age the uh, Aging Abraham, he stepped out into an open field and he he peeped into the deep darkness of the night sky. He saw countless stars that stretched far as his eyes could see. He tried to count them. He had tried to count them many times before, but he came up. You know, they're uncountable. But he, he he found himself in times. But he looked at his promise that he had. That you know, his promise of the of his lineage, his promise of his, his prosperity that outnumbered the stars. He didn't, he didn't dispute his promise that he had, but he did question how it could be possible to feel, fulfill this promise. How many of us today has ever had a promise in our life and we looked at that promise with what we could see and we looked at that, what we could see in our life and we find ourselves doubting how this could happen or how this could come about or how how could this ever going to happen in my life we look at things in life we look at situations and we may get a doctor's diagnosis and we look at that and we's like what this looks like everything looks bad but i have a promise from god that he can heal and he can change things but through i through and i'm maybe get to be ahead of myself here but through our eyes sometimes our situations looks like it's impossible but we're not looking at it through the same eyes or through the same lenses that God is. That God, the Lord had promised, in thy seed shall thy, all thy nations of the earth be blessed. In Genesis chapter 22 and verse 17, he says that in, ble- in, that in blessing I will bless thee and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gates of his enemies. And verse 18 says, And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because of thou hast obeyed my voice. But you hear the promise was, and I read this promise, is that his seed would be like the stars in the sky. Be like the sands on the on the beaches, and I think Brother Chris or somebody a couple of weeks ago talked about that. And how do how do you how do you look at that? You look at that in your situation, and that's that. Sometimes we find ourselves just like that, looking at our situation, looking at this promise that we have in life, and looking at how this could be, how how can this ever happen? But we question it. We Abraham was neither the first or the last to ask these probing questions of this kind of significance. Throughout, throughout time, philosophers, poets, prophets, and even people from all walks of life have questioned bigger things and bigger things than their abilities to comprehend. They've asked questions like, where did we come from? They've asked questions like, how did I get to here? When did life begin? Why are we, why are we here? 
we've all probably asked some of these same questions. We've looked at our life and looked at things and we're, sometimes where we're at in life. And we ask ourselves, how did I get to this place? Or, or, or what is my purpose? People have also come up with some rather imagin- imaginative answers to their own questions. They've come up with some crazy things. Some things in life, you know, how did I get here? And, and they come up with the things. And just like random, like by a random accident or by an explosion that manufactured a perfect environment in which life forms just magically appeared. Embracing some of these explanations requires a lot more faith to believe some of these wild things that just happen than to, to accept the view of creation as is recorded in the scripture. The Bible tells us the command of God's voice made matter and energy emerge when he said, let there be. When he said, let there be, when he spoke that word, countless millions of stars appeared in the sky. At his word, planets swirled into their orbits and comets blazed through the timeless sky. The earth spun into a perfect perfect spear, first perfect shape, and it began its rotation at a perfect speed, allowing balance of both gravity and force, making provision for, for free movement of every living being that God would create. Just think about that. When God said, let there be, all these things just happen. You know, we look at this and we look at this in our terms and we, we get this, it's overwhelming. When you think about, we just think about, we get up every morning, we walk outside and we see things we see. We're just getting up out of the bed. <laughs> and we're not floating around or we're not stuck to the floor. There's a lot of things happens and not just that. Being able to make a step in our, on our own power. There's a lot of things when we, we, our minds can't comprehend what all's going on around us. And all that happened when God said, let it be. The planets planets defined revolution around the sun, charted a path for seasons and for cycles. All this happened at perfect speed. The mark mark of days and times that God ultimately set in place for his purpose would be fulfilled. For Christians, the biblical account of creation is not only believable, but it is the author, the authoritative version of events explained, explaining our origin. You know, when we look at life, you know, we look at this. As, we, know, we don't just believe this. We understand the authority that happened. We understand what happened, not just in that, but how God can change our situations in our life. God's purpose in creation. God has an incredible purpose for every individual born in this world. He has, a, he has a purpose for us. God has an incredible purpose for our life. So many of us can quote Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning, God created. We look at that. No doubt we believe God created the universe. But we don't stop. We don't never stop enough times to appreciate the wonders of that truth. We look at this and we take it for granted. You know, God could have made made this world, he could have made it black and white if he wanted to. I mean, it would all still work. I mean, it would all still happen. But he made it in color. And so many times in life, you know, he made us in grown. I've, I've not traveled all over the world, but I have traveled a few places in my life. And, and I've seen some beautiful things that God created. And you look at things, you look at, you know, a lot of us love to go to the mountains and see the, see the beautiful views from the mountains and, mountains. and you say, why did God have to create a mountain? Why did he have to create the seashore, the seashores and the beaches where people love to go to the beaches? There's, there's so many things in this world that's beautiful to see. And God, God could have just made it all bland. But he wanted it for our, for our enjoyment just as much. I believe God didn't just say, well, I just want to make this halfway. I just want to do this. God wanted to make it, make it for us. And he, he, he did things, and I feel like in this thing, and I'm going to head on myself and my staff, but God wanted, us to, he wanted to, everything that he made, he made for us. And he, his enjoyment over creation 
It became infectious in us. The sons of God says, in the book of Job, he says, shouted for joy when the foundations of the earth were being laid. He wasn't just God that enjoyed this. I enjoyed what he made. Anybody here with me today? Enjoyed what he did for us. He enjoyed what he made for us. As a mother puts a bow in a daughter's hair, she doesn't do that to make, make the daughter pretty because the daughter's already pretty already. But God, she's, but God decorated the heavens and the earth not only to, for pure necessity, but rather out of the boundless love for what he had made. He made it because he loves it. He made it pretty because he loved it. He made even each one of us individually because he loves us individually. He made us because he made us just like we are. I mean, there's people in life that wanted to change what they are. He wanted to change this about their prior self, this about their, that or that about their self. But God made us individually. He made us like he wanted us to be made. He made it as for we're not. He didn't make creation wasn't a random act by God. He didn't just happen to, well, this, do this, and it just happened to fall in place. It wasn't just something random. Someone suggested the Big Bang Theory of creation would be like an F5 tornado ripping through a salvage yard filled with car parts only to, only to end up with this gleaming, beautiful, restored, classic car. Never such thing has happened from a, from a storm. Neither, does there, does our, did, neither did our planet emerge from some explosion of some matter. Be, you know, you think about that, and I thought about that when I read that story. You know, just that, that'd be about the same thing as if a, a tornado blew through there, and just all of a sudden these parts just came together in perfect place, and everything fell in place just perfect. But that is not true. Random destruction has never created order. And we find ourselves, we find this world, we, in this world, we, we find ourselves with chaos. And chaos, people trying to use chaos, but chaos has never produced perfection. And we live in a chaos world. But without God in our world, God the one that started this thing, well, God the one that created this thing, without God, our world is going to be chaos. And so if we don't have God at first and foremost in our life, there's going to be chaos in our life. At, every, at the very least, you know, we look at life, you know, it, there are serious scientists who has really studied this has to agree that there's something more than just a big bang or just more than just happenstance. There's some higher power. Some intelligent designer had to have been at work in the scheme of creation. When you look at the word creation, by definition, creation has to, is necessity of a creator. We have, creation had to have a creator. It ain't just happened by it. God had a purpose for everything that he created. Some assembly, sometimes in life, you know, we go through things. Has anybody ordered something off the thing and it's been shipped to your house and it's in a box? Here a while back, and I, just want, I don't want to get too far on the stories, but here a while back we, we had this piece of furniture, a stand-up piece of furniture, and we ordered it. And when it came in the mail or came by UPS and they dropped it off on our back porch, it was in a, it was a probably, a, it was actually a platform. And when, you know, pull, a pulpit, and we had ordered, and, and when we got there, you know, it was probably about as high as this pulpit, and it came in a box about eight inches thick. It said, some assembly required. And I looked at that box, and before I even opened that box, I was like, some assembly required. I'm like, this has got to be a lot of assembly acquired. But, but most of the time, this, when this, this word, this little statement, some assembly required, can be misleading. You know, we've looked at things, and we probably as parents, a lot of older parents in here, it's probably on, around Christmas time, has, has ordered things or got things, and it says, there's just a little bit of assembly required. And, and when, when we, we pull, open the, up the box and the pieces scattered everywhere, and then you're, you know, most of us men start out trying to just put it together. That, that's, that's me anyway. When I get to where I can't, well, this don't fit no more, then I back up and say, where's these instructions? But then these, these, these instructions are insufficient. They got, they're cryptid. You got to do everything, you know, just right. And I don't, I don't go by that most of the time. And, but sometimes, sometimes I wind up taking it all back apart and starting over. 
But in life, you know, sometimes we find ourselves, you know, we look at these. I look for the illustrations, the pictures. I look at the pictures and I say, well, if I can put, I see this picture and this picture and I put it together, that'll work, right? And so, so many times in life, you know, we find ourselves trying to put things together and we find ourselves with a few extra parts. They always, we always hope these extra, this extra bold or this, all they just, I always tell my wife, I say, oh, they just threw a couple extras in where if I lose one. (laughs) That's always my excuse for the extra parts. They just threw a couple extras in. But (laughs) when God spoke the world into creation, the creative forces, every command commanded a divine purpose. Creation was not a cosmic experience so he could see what he would eventually have. No necessary or extra parts are scattered throughout our world. He didn't, when God created the earth or created the world or created creation, he didn't have no extra stuff laying around. Everything that he spoke into existence had a purpose. Every aspect of creation is conjoined in relationship. All forms of, all life forms are complementary of each other. Everything that exists in some way supports other life forms by its existence. When you look at the, look at the, the, the world we live in and you look at, even go into the ocean and you look at the micro small animals as he, God just spoke into existence. Some of, them, some of them mankind has never even seen in the ocean. But God created them for a reason. Other, other life forms need them. Sometimes it may be for food. He may, be, he may have created them for the, the food chain. But some of them, some things in life on God created just to help others, things prosper. You know, life, you know, animals, you know, we look at the animal kingdom and there's so many things, you know, and I, and I like to watch the Discovery Channel sometimes and Discovery stuff. And we look at things and we look, well, well, this animal does this and it creates this plant to grow because it did that. And now this plant, this, this animal can survive off the food of that plant. It was created because this animal did this or this happened there. We look at that plan and we like, how did, you know, how did this, this just didn't happen. This just didn't happen from any explosion. This just couldn't happen. Because someone had to, you know, God had to, every intricate detail. We look at our human bodies, how our own bodies works. Our bodies work, so it has to work, everything has to work together. If one thing's off in our body, it changes everything. I had went to the doctor this week, and when I went to the doctor, you know, they talking about she was talking about my blood work, and she says, you know, you need to keep this here little level here it needs to be a little bit further down. Talking about my sugar and my little this stuff, stuff, you know. And she says, you need to eat a little bit better food because what you eat affects the rest of your body. And so everything that you do, so some of the smallest things, because God made this body, made this world complicated, and it all has to work together. If God had such a grand purpose for the smallest animals in, the, in, the, in our environment, the unseen elements of creation, why would we not have an equal, grand, and even greater purpose for the human race? The crown glory of his creation. The, who he, he made in his own image. If we can think about how he, he created these animals and, and how he was so concerned about their well-being, how much more should we be about the, his pride and joy? How we, when he formed in his own image, every person has a purpose. Humans lead the creative order in intelligence and all are intended to serve a greater cause. Some people are not more essential than others. Just about a year ago, we had this, this pandemic was going on and I don't like to talk about that just because that's what crowds every conversation. But today, you know, they had this thing come out as essential workers. Like some workers were more important than others. And, I, and I'm here today, and that, that just kind of, and I understand that theory behind that. Because there's some people that had to work, didn't matter what. And, but, but I understand that, that theory. But that theory kind of sometimes leads over into in other parts of our life. We feel like somebody's more important than the other person. And, but I'm here today to tell everyone that no one is important, more important to God. 
It doesn't matter if he has a big, huge bank account or if he's living on the streets. He's still just as important to God. It doesn't matter how your bank account, it don't matter where you're from and nothing about you. God still cares just as much about every one of us. And we're all essential to him. We're all essential to each other. I, as Brother Jerry said, just I think Wednesday night, he said, I need you. I need every one of you. To live a Christian life, I need you. Because I have to lean on you in times when I can't and I'm not strong. And I have to, and you may need me the next day, but we have to, we need each other. We're all essential to everyone's life. And we need to be constantly, constantly reaching and being there for each other. And I feel like we were essential, and God wants us to be that way. Rather, each one of us has a value to God. We're all precious in His sight and His plan. He has a plan for every human life. God desires to have a relationship with humanity. Today, that's what the part of the purpose of creation I'm talking about today is that relationship with Christ. He built us. He, he designed us. He created us. He formed us in his hands to have a relationship. That's what he, 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 he created the whole universe for is so he could have a relationship with us. The very vastness and the beauty of our universe can actually lure the human mind into misunderstanding about its creator. God cares for all creations. It is easy to assume that God is too great to attend to the small matters of life. When we look at God, we look at the one that spoke this world into existence. Sometimes in life, we, we, we have problems. Oh, this problem ain't big enough. Oh, I ain't, I'm not going to carry this to God. I'm going to take care of this. All right? I've talked about myself tonight anyway. <laughs> I can talk about myself because I know I find myself there. Oh, I, I, I can handle this. this. This is not big enough for God to take care of. And most of the time I get myself in a mess. But today if we look at life and we look at how big God is. And so many times in life we find ourselves, well, this is a small matters. This is nothing to God. But, it is kind, but that kind of thinking is, is our humanity. Our flesh coming out. We think about heaven and the powerful, how powerful it is, and the staggering distance it is from here to there. And then we project our limitations on onto God. When we look at our limitations, so many times in life, what we can accomplish. So many times in life, we 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 in our spirit, we we allow that, or we we give that, or project that onto onto God. The limitations to God. We all know that when we are when we like what it is like to feel unimportant. But we make that mistake about God and we infer that from the from this grandness of universe that he must have some better things to do to deal with my little problem. But I'm here today to tell you the truth that it is not the vastness of the universe that we see the vastness of God. It's not how big God is. It's not big how big the God is. The truth is, is the vastness of the universe is, is how we look at it. But we need to look at it as, as how the presence is of God. When God is in our presence, God is, he's, he's here in each one of our lives. He cares about each one of us here today. He cares about the smallest things in life. When we look at life as a, like a spider, it's perspective of a human's life. Look at our the human stadiums, and we look at it as a spider looks at the stadiums and the skyscrapers. They must think that that that's a, seems awful big. As a spider looking at our building, like this building here, a small spider or a small insect. Sometimes that's how we look at the, look at our world, the world around us. Nothing is in the universe is truly big. Largeness and smallness are relative terms. A star is big until you compare it to a galaxy. A mountain is big until you compare it to a star. A tree is big until you compare it to a mountain. Anything in this world that we think is big, there's always something bigger. And when you compare it, what it depends on what you're comparing it to. We cannot determine what God's value simply by measuring and comparing as we see things. Through our eyes. 
And that's what we try to do every we we try to see it through our eyes. And we compare things to that. God is not greater because he is indefinitely big. He is greater because he is infinitely present. It don't matter how it's not how big God is. As I said just a minute ago, he, he, is, he is in our lives. He's in each one of our lives. He cares about us, and he's there for us all the time. How vast must the Holy One's attention span be to attend a sparrow's funeral and make the mathematic recalculation every time a hair falls from our head of the 8 billion human beings on the earth today? Think about how God is, how big God is, how big his attention span is. My attention span don't last very long. <laughs> My mind is traveling back and forth many places in just a matter of seconds. But God has got to be his attention span on, on each one of us. If he cares if our, how number our hair is, how many, how many times, you know, if a hair, he recalculates that every time we lose a hair. How much does he care about our situations? As I said earlier, when we look at situations in our life, well, this is too small for God. If he's worried about the count of our hair or he's worried about the small things in our life, he's there for us. But God's behavior toward us, his infinite love, his gift of his presence, and the fact that he became a man himself tells us all that we need to know about God. His love for us and him becoming a man himself and suffering all he did on, the, on this earth just because he loves us. That tells us all we need to know about God. And he, he is reaching out for our relationship. He's reaching out for us. God breathed on man and gave him life. Human was created on the sixth day and God formed him with his bare hands. He formed him out of the dust. He created everything else. He could have spoke us into existence too. He spoke animals and the complex animals and, and all the, the complex things he spoke into existence. But he formed us with his hands. He formed us because he has a relationship with us. He desires a relationship with us. God formed us from the dirt. And then, he, then in Genesis 2 and 7, the Bible says, And God breathed life into the still form of his design. And man became a living soul. And we sing that song. We sing it a few weeks ago. We sing that song that every breath... Is yours, God? I'm not a singer, so I'm not no. <laughs> but I, but the, the, the meaning of that song is every breath that I take is yours. Because God breathed that breath in every one of us. So many times in life, you know, our breath goes and comes by him. And so many times in life when we take a breath every morning, we take a deep breath. We think about that's God's breath. What am I going to do with, and, I, and here the last time they sang that song here, I stood there with tears running down my eyes because I felt like, okay, God, that's my, every breath that I take is yours. You gave it to me. You breathed your breath into me. What am I going to do with that breath? Am I just going to waste it on something else or, or I'm just going to throw it away? God, you gave me that breath. It's your breath. It's not mine. It's your breath. What I do with that breath that you gave me, it matters because we know life and death is in the breath. My son-in-law is a paramedic and he says, I can, I can make your heart beat, but if you don't breathe, you won't lie, live. God gave us that breath. And because he gave us that breath, that is what's between death, life and death. We gotta have that breath. We've gotta have that oxygen flowing through our body. And we gotta have that moving because God gave us that breath. Creation gives value to every soul. No soul is no, not valuable. Today, I just feel like God has created this world. He created the whole world for humanity, for our enjoyment, or for our sustaining, not just for our enjoyment. He, he had, we had to create the, the animals. He had to create the, 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 the vegetation because we needed something to live on. As he created the world, if you notice throughout the days of creation, everything he created, he created what the next day, he, what he was going to create the next day, he created the thing they, they needed to sustain them the day before. And throughout creation, 
You know, we, 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 and that's how he designed it. And so he knew already in his plan what we were going to need. So that's why he created the whole world around us. It's because he needed that because he wanted to sustain us today. Today is I want to, God, place humanity in a prepared place. And so today is we, we find, he, and he wanted to have a relationship with us. He desires to have a relationship with us. Today is we, if we, we look in our life and we just settle, settle on our life, we find ourselves longing for relationships because God put that emptiness in our life. And that's where the world is falling further away from him somebody because they're looking for that relationship that God put in them, designed in us. The relationship that should be between me and us and him. So many people are drifting further away from that. But God says, today I just want to, my, my, it's been striving in my soul ever since I've been working on this, this message, is God is desiring a relationship for us. We ask that question, why don't we have that relationship? If he wants a relationship that's so bad with us and we desire relationships, why aren't we connecting? Why aren't we being there? And I feel like God spoke to me. He says, because you decide your relationship. You decide where you're going in relationship. You decide if you're going to have a relationship with me or not. And every one of us makes that decision. Every one of us makes that decision. We make a decision where we're, if we're going to love God back like he loves us. Or if we're going to make that, we're going to, we have to make a decision. Today, in this place, if you're not where you should be with God, it's because of the decision you made. If you're not, you feel like you're not where you need to be with God, it's because you decided not to be there. And I don't want to, I'm not trying to be too bold or not trying to be this way, but I just, if we're not where we need to be with God, it's because we're not. God is there with open arms. God is standing there waiting for us. He's wanting us to be there. If we're not a church we need to be, it's because we decide not to be the church we need to be. If we're not having, seeing things like Brother, Brother Herndon preached about, if we're not having revival like we should have revival, it's because we've decided not to. We've decided to sit back and be comfortable where we're at. But today, I just have this in my spirit, and this ain't even in my notes today, but I feel like God is wanting us to push further. He's wanting us to push further. He's wanting us to have that relationship. And as, as I was talking to Brother, Brother Allen, the Everett today, this morning before service, he says, I feel like this place is wrapping up and we feel that, all feel that. But today, God is reaching for our lost souls. He's reaching for that relationship. He created us to have a relationship. And today, if we're not in that relationship with God, we need to be. We need to decide. We've got to push further. We've got to push on further. We've got to get further closer to God today. I feel like we've got to make that decision. This is where we've got to go, and we've got to push to that. Every good and perfect gift has been given to us from above. Everything that we need is from above. But for all the skills that developed in predicting and regulating life, there is a cost. And we lose that sometimes in life. That's where, we, that's where we step out because there's going to be a cost. There's going to be something that's going to cost us. But in a marriage, if you have a relationship with your wife, I'll be married 30 years next May. And I've learned something a little bit in that 30 years. If you want to have a relationship and the relationship be right, you have to put some cost into it. You got to have some skin in the game. And today, sometimes in life, when we feel like, you know, we got to give up something or we may have to push back the plate a little bit and get to get what we want from God and build on that relationship. Sometimes we, we, we don't want to give up that cost. We don't want to step out of that comfort zone. We feel comfortable here when we feel, when we walk into a service and we feel God and we feel like, oh, okay, I'm okay. And that's all I need to feel. Long as I feel God. But I feel like God is wanting more. He's wanting a more of a relationship. He's wanting us to push further. He's wanting us to go further. And I feel like every service has been building for that. I feel like God is wanting a more powerful relationship in our life. And we're going to have to give up some things. We're going to have to get some cost. And so many times in life we find ourselves, ourselves not wanting to give that cost. 
As a child, you know, sometimes in life we find the, the world around us is surprising. Everything that we see and everything that we, we find in our life, you know, we, we look at everything with a different view of eyes. And God said, you know, in the Bible, the Scripture says to have childlike faith. So many times in life we find ourselves you know, with our abilities and we, we try to overcome things and do things in life and we find ourselves getting away from that childlike faith. Everything is a surprise to a child. They, they're excited about everything. They're excited about church. They're excited about whatever they're going. They, they're excited about it. And sometimes we as adults, we may be for whatever reason, we've lost that excitement. We've lost that childlike in our life. And, and I feel like sometimes we need to get back to that. I know we don't have that same energy. I don't even want some of that energy they have because my body couldn't handle that energy they have. But, but I, want, I want some of that, 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 that faith and that mindset. We've got to get excited about what God is wanting to do. We've got to be excited about that relationship. A child, when you can look at them and they know that you love them and they want to, they want to show that back. So many times in life, that's where we find ourselves. We've traded that wonderful thing in life so many times for, for life. We've traded that excitement and we've traded that things for all different reasons. I have to get through my notes here because I've been all over the place. But, but God created everything just to have a relationship with Him. And today, is, is we're, if we're not today in this place where we need to be with God, we need to make that decision to drive for that, go for that. How can we encourage one another to behold the fresh wonders of God's creation? We need to be there for each other. And today, as, as I begin to close, I feel like I want us to stand across this place today. I feel like God is wanting to do something here. I know this is a Bible lesson, but I feel like God is, is, is wanting to, to create, a, a recreate, reconnect with our relationship today. I feel like God is wanting to, he's, he's pushing for a closer relationship. I feel like he's pushing harder in our life. And I feel like he's wanting that more and more in us. And today we need to decide, we need to decide in our life, is this what I want? God is what I want. And God created the whole earth for me. What am I going to do for him? Today I want us to, just in our own minds, and I know it's a little bit different, but I just want us to raise our hands today and just reach out to God and say thank him for what he's done for us. Thank him for what he's done in our life and what he created for me. And thank him for what he's raised and thank him for his desire. And I want us to push hard for his relationship today. And I want us to work hard to decide today that this is not I'm not going to keep going on this old ordinary road. I'm going to push harder for God. And I want to do my part of this relationship. And I want to go streets for him today. And I want him to be that close relationship with me today. And I want to move upon him, Lord. Lord, I ask you to touch us and anoint us today. Lord, in Jesus' name. In Jesus.